Tony John in conversation. Within five minutes of the first ever conversation we have, it feels like I've known him all my life. That's the magic of Roger Nev, a brilliant photographer and a man with the uncanny ability to make you feel noticed, appreciated, and the center of his world. Even after spending just five minutes with him, I call that a superpower. Even though we've spoken just twice before, Roger Nev feels like a friend. I suspect the reason I feel this way lies at the heart of his immensely successful career as a photographer. A serial crisscrosser of continents, Roger literally exemplifies the most glamorous impression one might have of a globe-trotting photographer, shooting a superstar athlete in Paris before breakfast, then a celebrity at a Hollywood movie set at lunchtime, and um, rounding up the day with a fashion spread for Vogue in the Moroccan desert as the sun sets. I speak hyperbolically, of course, yet I wouldn't be surprised, surprised if Roger's life isn't too far away from this implausible 24-hour schedule I just described. If someone could pull it off, Roger Nev would be the candidate. And this is why I'm dying to find out how this man has structured a life that is packed to the brim, yet always able to accommodate new conversations, friendships, and photography assignments in the furthest reaches of the planet to capture people, places, moments, and everything in between. Roger, welcome. Oh, thank you, Val. <laughs> thank you so much, Tony. Dutch, English, wow. doesn't matter. What a wonderful introduction. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that's, uh, uh, that's the impression you leave, yeah. you have left at least on another human being. Yeah, it's, so. it's wonderful. And uh, true, by my life is quite wonderful. You know, happy to, uh, to be here and, and talk a little bit about it, even though I, I'm always preferring to be on the other side. I just told your cameraman, like... It's nice to be uh, safe on the other side of the camera, but thank you so much for having me. And uh, we had a wonderful conversation and my life is quite extraordinary. And it's been like that since I, as a student, decided to, I wanted to do what I'm doing now and I'm still doing it. And every morning I do actually wake up like, this is great, here we go. You know, so I, I feel good about it. Yeah, you just said something really nice. And it's, I think it's, a, it's the most beautiful way to start something, which is a reflection of my life is wonderful. I think we need more of that. You know, each of us needs that mantra to be part of our <laughs> starting starting conversation with ourselves. Yeah. Right? yeah. There, there's a, there's never a boring moment. Let me put it that way. There's never a moment where like, okay, what shall I do today? There's somehow I like to plan things. Yeah. But I can I'm most of the time only planning a day ahead or the day itself. Um, I like to be not too committal to to certain things. Also, socially, even though I would like to, it's just impossible. Um, last night I got a phone call. To um, you know, I'm a I'm a big soccer fan. Yes. So yes, I know. Uh, I got a phone call. Like, are you interested in going? And of course, you know, like with everything that's going on, it's like, oh my God, can you imagine? I I could maybe go to the World Cup. Of course, I have my doubts about certain things. Yeah. Uh, but then that keeps you awake. Like, what are the options? What are the possibilities? Um, my so passion yeah. would definitely uh, is telling me yes to go. So we'll see how this goes today. So th this is interesting. <laughs> uh, th this ties back to um, my impression of your life, right? It really feels that way to me. I mean, you feel like you're everywhere, um, you know, doing work. Yeah. getting things done, and at the same time, you know, it, the next 50 things are lined up. But I also know that behind the scenes, you work together with your wife, and, yes. and Trish yeah. is the organizer and the planner, right? She keeps it together. She keeps it together. She keeps your life together. Um, yeah, she, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course and, and so going back to the World Cup situation, so you get a call last night. Yeah. You're in Amsterdam, Trish is in New York. You get a call saying, hey, Roger, Qatar, World Cup, how about it, right? So how does that how does that work out in in your professional calendar? Right, I was asked to uh, to photograph for an American soccer magazine, uh, Mason Mount. Uh, he's going for the English team. He's a national of uh, the UK team. So we had a wonderful shoot in London, and the creative director from that he got contacted by a French publisher yesterday. Do you know anybody that would love to go to the to the games in Qatar? I didn't even think of it because I always told people if I go, I'm a big 
Dutch fan, of course. I'm in Orange in New York when I'm watching the games. Um, I was like, ooh, if I ever was asked to go for a good reason, then I think about it. You know, like more as a fan. Yeah. Uh, so the, the here it is. So. So it's it's a, it's an assignment. It's an assignment, oh, which is. Okay. Which is kind of the reason I thought I'm not going to go privately just for myself because I love soccer. No, I have to have a very good reason, a better reason to create something beautiful. So to create something interesting. You know, when I photograph these players also, I, I try to not just shoot them with the ball on their heads or on their feet. It, it has to have a deeper value or a bit of something of comics, uh, make it a cartoon or make it a dream world for them. So they, they are inspired by something that's not even known to them. So so um, we spoke about that in the past, right? Yeah. You, you, you photographed Neymar and yeah. uh, Firmino of Liverpool right. as well, and both had very interesting stories because both were provocative photographs, eventually, that yeah. the, the athletes themselves wanted, yes. right? And I thought the 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 approach um, was very interesting because you put them at ease, you you build trust, right, and then you get you get them to be themselves, right? Yeah. But in the World Cup setting, I mean, these guys are on the strictest of timetables and schedules. Every second is is accounted for, right? How how do you fit in your process into? I try to yeah. uh, prepare myself really well, but also give yourself freedom to stray away from the, the the tight plan so like say you have only an hour or 45 minutes within that time you often have to have an interview with them which i don't do but no there's an interviewer then uh, i do spend at least five or ten minutes first to show my sketches my ideas that i worked out before so you do a little bit of research not too much you know some player might be interested in hard rock that's an interesting, you know, De Gea of United. Um, he was very shy in a way. Of course, they never want to be really photographed. It's another press day where they have to show up and buy contract, blah, blah. So you got to make it interesting for them quite fast, you know, like get their attention. And so I bought a, a this is definitely also I do together with my wife who comes up with wonderful ideas. So she's more the creative uh, instinct instigator and I can be the executioner. Um, I bought a very cheap wooden guitar in New York, brought it with me to the shoot in Madrid and we pretended the dressing room was like the dressing room during a concert. I said, here it is and go bang away, <laughs> you know, left, right, on the floor, uh, try to smash it like a hard rock concert. So that got the aggression out in him and I played really hard rock music, which is not my thing really, but it's loud as well, I was it was it music De Gea liked? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you, you how did you find that out? Um, through my wife also. She like so we had a little playlist and he loved it. You know, okay. like so Guns N' Roses, play it loud. Um, we also then I was inspired by certain album covers of you know Queen, you know the Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah. so you do that top light. So they become into a whole different cinematic world. So they can leave their so personas not, and inhibit another persona. Right, basically. they're not on the field anymore. Yeah, they yeah. stray away from catching that ball. And that, that really uh, was great. Yeah. I think I, uh, I, I must think that as a professional photographer who's, who's photographed, I don't know, is it thousands by now of, of human beings? Um, you, the, you? The yeah. amount of yeah. people? Probably. Probably. So yes. with, with all of that, you must have become quite um, quite proficient at studying human nature and understanding personality types, right? Sometimes it feels like you're a bit of a psychologist or philosopher, even though I never studied in that area. But uh, every day is very different. Uh, there's definitely rules, you know, when you speak to people, you know, look them straight in the eye, you know, like and have listen listen first to what, what's the body language, uh, little things that you unconsciously notice and work with. You know, when I feel like, a, in this case, a player is a bit shy, an actor, actors or actresses are very outgoing, you know, so give them motivation, you know, give them a part, give them a role, give them an inspiration, give them somebody they, they dream to play. Um, then you see they light up, you see the fire, or you give them a, a nice a nice theme to work with. I just worked with this actress 
and she was wonderful. She told me a bit about a movie, which was quite depressing, what she was going to play, be playing in. And so that's not something I wanted to portray. But then I thought, we can give her a dream. You know, it doesn't have to be depressive. She can also come out of that depression, draw your own uh, cubicle box. And how do you visualize that? So now she's in a box. I need to get out of here. So I photographed her standing. You drop the, the image. So she becomes floating on clouds. This reminds me, when I fly back tomorrow, <laughs> I need that plate of from the plane uh, to do the clouds from above. Because we always shoot clouds from below, but I need to have her floating on the clouds. So these are little tricks that you add to your dreams. And um, you know, my, um, I spoke to my retoucher, a wonderful guy. You know, like sometimes when retouch gets out of hand for me, I'm like, there's people that do that much better than I do myself. <laughs> so then I discuss these images with him, which is wonderful. So it's really important. I'm never the only one making these images. There, there's, there's a lot more thought and people behind it, before and after. Um, you know, it's my team. And I always say, I told you that before too. And I'm only as good as my team, but I like to be part of it, that's for sure. <laughs> you know? yeah, it sounds that's that for way. Sure. So maybe a nice yeah. track during yeah. that shoot would be Joni Mitchell's Boat Sides Now. Because there's a line that goes, I've looked at clouds from both sides now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. But so uh, going back to, going back to, um, so the football player is, is probably reserved and shy. So you got to get them out of their shell, right? When it comes to actors, and they're also in a in a time problem, you know, they, they're yeah, very little uh, time on their hands. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> and I think any anyone who's achieved a certain level of celebrity or success is encountering the same thing, right? You have very little time with them. Um, Most of them, yeah. because they they are pulled aside by their agents, their brothers, their sisters, their friends. It's like. Yeah. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, you, but, but I'm just thinking of the one thing about about um, actors and actresses because you photographed many of them, right? Yep. And they, they their craft is to create character and persona. Yeah. Right. If the assignment is to capture the truth of of an actor, how do you do that? That's a that's a tough question. Because it's true. Normally, I have to come up with an idea, so I already pretend. I know them, or try to pick something from their personality that I found interesting to visualize. Um, in a way, I'm also not too I'm curious about the person, but I don't need to know too much. There's always a surprise element, and that will come out automatically. You know, like, and then it's also real, a smile. You know, so I do not necessarily need to know them Perfectly. I do some research on them. Some, th some things I really don't want to know. I had people that, that I photographed that said, Roger, you have to read the interview because most, most of the time they already have done an interview and then we make the pictures. And I went, no, 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 I don't want to read it because I don't want to be influenced by what they had to say about themselves or their lives or their families. I want to stay in my story. And I'm, I came prepared because I had my own story. So if I have an actor, then I want to make him, portray him like, say, an adventurist or a James Bond. And I read the story about his mom and dad and all the kids, then you're out of your my space. fantasy yeah. is gone yeah, too. Yeah. I need to s keep the part and keep him motivated for what my plan was, which I'm about to present to him now. Yeah, and get, most of yeah. the time they love it. And sometimes they're like, oh, no, I cannot do that. That's a little too far, yeah. you know, having somebody walk in Venice uh, in a pajama on bare feet in the middle of the street. This, this singer actor was like, mm, uh, no, we cannot do that. The next day though, at breakfast, he was like, you know, let's do that one idea you had. I'm like, great, you know, so you found their trust, but you have to take them out of, out of their comfort zone a little bit, definitely. And then you found their trust somehow you know, I want them to be agreeable with the ideas, but then you have to push it a little bit. And once I have, you have that trust, you can push it. And then there is sometimes How even they, they even go further. How do you know when the trust is established? 
uh, it's that's a, a bit of a body language too. You know, when okay. when they come closer to you, they're not all of a sudden they're like, "Can we do this?" Or, you know, they 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 love the picture. Also, what's also also wonderful is when they start to photograph the screenshot on the computer. That's a sign. Well, that's yeah. always a sign, especially with models. When they see like, "Ooh, I like that," and it's not retouched, nothing yeah. is done, and they already like it, then. That's always a compliment. It's like the old days when you had Polaroids. Can I have one too? Yeah. Of course. Um, yeah, trust. That's definitely a very important. Firmino was a great example of that, I think. You know, when. Yeah, you, you should he, tell the story. Yeah, he, the story he, is just too yeah. good. So, Firmino, you know, what do you do with him? Yes, he's a wonderful player, good looking, Brazilian. You know, they're, they're upbeat. Um, his his uh, characteristics are his white teeth caps and his uh, big smile and his big, big smile, smile big smile yeah. so i brought to the to the shoot i brought this oversized 40 centimeter long maybe a half a meter toothbrush i thought it's great for a cover you know the toothbrush was bigger than his face and his agents were like no, no, no that's you know I'm making a joke of him now i do not know the reason but uh i said okay fine you know i have a table with props sometimes props help Boxing, boxing gloves. So let him box, okay. He's Muhammad Ali. A lot of footwork. At the end of the day, he's like, but I keep the props there in sight of where they still can see the corner of their eye. And it was a great shoot. I had him drink at some point. I said, give me your shoe. I thought, okay, what do you do with the shoe? It was also Adidas was involved in the sponsoring. So I pour a cup of water in it. And it was a new shoe because these players they get so many shoes and so i knew it was new <coughs> put a cup in it okay here drink it so he had to drink from his shoe and this is firmino as well firmino okay yeah. so he drinks from his yeah shoe. his yeah. agent again like oh my god what are you doing you know like i said it's it's a new shoe it's not it doesn't smell bad it's yeah. just leather you know just actually i think i i did a little myself to to show it's safe <laughs> you shared shoe shots <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So here he goes. Uh, Great shot. You just got to be very prepared for it then. Yeah. You know, be prepared that you have the shot. But because you only get a moment a couple of times. You know, that drink, that shoe is going to be empty. Was it used at the end, that shot? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's it's even on my website, I think. And I use it on my WeTransfers. Okay. I still keep it there because I, it always makes me smile. The so shot you're proud like of that. that shot. Yeah. So, and so definitely be ready. You know, before I shoot, I really come in early. I'm always early because I want to feel the space. I want to see the space. Um, it's almost like you, you um, yeah, every corner, I want to feel the light. So with Neymar also, I make sure I had 10 sets. I only had them one hour. I make it very ambitious. Let's get, try to get 10 shots, but bam, 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 bam. So I have lights out up here, here, there. The ideas are ready, 10 frames, 30 frames, which is rare for me too, because normally when I shoot, mostly fashion, you make thousands of, of shots, but with these players, you just gotta be very resolute. So the toothbrush came in and he did it. He's like, Roger, that toothbrush, let's do it. I'm like, great, boom, boom, it w became the cover. Yeah, uh, and he loved it. So he Firmino it. had the toothbrush, which was, I guess, unique, but have you come down to a set of, of props that kind of like loosen up anyone you're you're photographing. Loosen up. I mean, do do you travel with these props in the club? No, 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 <laughs> no. Every, it's every, customized per shoot. Yeah, yeah, every set, and also again, my wife is very important. This she's very good at shopping. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so she she goes out to to find the, the good props. Okay. Uh, so there's not one prop that's always there at every shoot. No, because no, okay. it's always different. And. Um, Please, please look at the uh, the new shots that are about to come out this week, if I may say. It's uh, with Mason Mount. Yeah. It's uh, for 8x8 magazine in America. And uh, it's, uh, I made him an artist, you know, because these soccer players, they're artists with their feet. So Absolutely. we made him into an artist. So I brought a lot of paint. I shot him in England. I went to some paint stores. Uh, we had some props from New York um, and it, was fantastic and mason was definitely one that's like not shy 
Okay. He loved being there. He came in with a big smile, and that's how we started and ended. And how long? And was he that threw a whole bucket of paint at my camera. <laughs> yeah, a whole bucket of paint. Well, that, paint. That, yeah. that means he got really familiar yeah. and it really comfortable. Yeah. Oh my God, it was so much fun, and he was. He had to shower at least for an hour because he was full of all colors. Was it Chelsea paint. blue? A Chelsea blue. Uh, that's what we started with. <laughs> but since it was the World Cup, uh, we also wanted to definitely add uh, the the British uh, colors of the flag. And uh, that's where I almost made a big mistake, being not British. I had a, I had the flag with the three colors. Yeah. And luckily, the videographer was like, ah, Roger, mistake. You know, the, the real flag for the English team is just white and red. Yes, the cross. The uh, cross. Yeah, and yeah. not the Union Jack. So luckily, right, yeah. just in time, we switched it. We had it both ways, by the way. <laughs> I love the Union Jack, too. Close shave. Yeah, yeah I, but, I, I think the Union Jack is iconic, right? Yes, it's a it cultural is. symbol, but yeah. it's true. Um, many people think that's the flag of the United Kingdom or England, but it's... So there. So is I was it the St. Christopher Cross? No, I forget yeah, what it was. But uh, it's great. Yeah. Check it out. It's, uh, it's so great. it's it's so lovely that um, it's so lovely to speak to a professional who gets excited like a child speaking of his profession. I, I just I find that beautiful. I mean, I've had the f I've had the great fortune to to sit across people who get this excited about what they do, and, and so I have to ask you this question. Um, you've been doing this for a long time, mm -hmm. right? I think it's it's definitely come over two decades of being a professional photographer, yeah, correct? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stick to that for now. What does a photograph mean to you? Yeah, it's for me, the, the photograph always gives me so much pleasure, especially when you when you make it, when you produce it, then when you see it, and then I have to say, or when it's like, in the secret compartment, it used to be film, then it gets developed. But when I download my images now, the curiosity, like, oh, are we there? Do we have something? Do you have a wow factor? That moment is so beautiful. It's like a candy moment. It's like, like a little kid, you get a new car, that you can, a new toy that you can play with. That to me is still a photograph. You know, the curiosity, like, how did it go? And of course, when you shoot, you feel good, da, da, da. but when you see that image, it's a pure satisfaction in a way. It's the candy that's like never ends. When, when did you first feel this? Um, Do you remember? Definitely when I was very young, I was in uh, middlebar school. Uh, so like what, between, between 12 and, and... 12 and 14. 14. Yeah, I do definitely remember very well what happened. Uh, you know, when everything is a blur in life, but when I was 12, uh, I remember the, the guy, Frank, he took me to a dark room in school. He was in a photo club, small closet, and this thing came up. I'm like, oh my God, that came out of nowhere. So it was magic, pure magic. And that's what it still is. You know, the, the, when the, the developer, the stopping bath, and then the fixation, and then you rinse it, but when when that developer came up and he saw those tones, he saw those images, I was like, I didn't know nothing about chemistry or anything, so I didn't know really what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> but there it was, uh, Prince, and then I got a summer job when I was 14, 15 in a photo store, and that was definitely, um, then I knew, because this, this gentleman, he asked me, uh, okay, Roche, you have to talk about what you're gonna make this summer. I'm like, I don't want money, I want a camera, and that was it. He he. He showed me. Um, he said, "Okay, pick a camera." Yeah. And, and then did you did you get it at the end of your summer job? No, that day. That was a very trusting yeah, I, I trusting employer. I worked <laughs> there for six weeks, the whole summer vacation. Yeah. Loved it. So I started to make pictures of weddings and birthdays, and and uh, got got to you know you learn by doing. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, and uh, did you already learn to develop? Yes, also because he had a little dark room uh, where where pictures were developed, you know, pass photos yeah. and and wedding pictures. So and he was quite old, so he always took a nap uh, in the afternoon at lunchtime. And then I got to go in the dark room and make prints for him and for myself and for my family. So I always got to spend some time by doing and then you know like it was a great tutor how old were you then again i was i think i think 
14, 15. Oh yeah, it's really young. Eh? Because I, I also remember uh, I'm from the south. Everything yeah. had to go by bike. It's like 12 kilometers back and forth uh, going by the soccer fields. And I had kind of had to give up my soccer passion there. Because so it was either I work or I, I have fun and play soccer. <laughs> so so the, the, the sacrifice of soccer, yeah. was it because you had to work or was it because this photography thing started started becoming another passion that you didn't I think it was definitely the, yeah? the latter, yeah. Okay. The, the photography was wonderful. Do you remember what camera it was? That very yeah, Palos TM, automatic. Uh, Palos TM, it was then uh, 259 guilders. So a lot a of money. A lot of money, and it yeah. was with a screw screw lens. And then I also got like a 50 millimeter and 135. It's like... It's like you put it on the shelf, you know, it's so beautiful. So if it didn't use it, I put it on the shelf so I could see it. <laughs> you still have it? <laughs> you know, I regret that I, I gave it to a, a wonderful girlfriend yeah. who was studying graphic design. When I was already studying photography, she used it really well. She became a very well-known designer. And uh, so she was at the Academy of Art. She needed a camera. And so she, uh, yeah, I should... I should call her one day. Do you still have that camera? Yeah, because it's then... It's got a lot of uh, sentimental uh, value. Yeah. yeah, it does. And a couple of years ago, I actually went on the Marktplatz here in Holland to uh, to buy one. So I bought one. So, so I, I have one, but it's not... So, so tell yeah. me, I, I, <laughs> I've done this as well. Yeah. And I did this for something completely different, which was when I, when I first fell in love with football, coming from Malaysia. We're from a British colony, so we were following English soccer, of course, right? Yeah. And I was a big Manchester United fan, you know, um, from the Ron Atkinson days, if you remember how far back that goes, right? Yeah. And, and uh, I, the moment I had, I had enough pocket money on a regular basis, right, um, I discovered that I could buy these magazines from the UK. It was called Match and Shoot. There were two different magazines about football, right? And, um, and I used to buy them and collect them. And then sometime when, when I moved out of Malaysia, um, you know, you have all these magazines in piles and, and my, my match and shoot collections disappeared. Yep. And like a couple of years ago, I came across, I think on, on eBay or something, someone selling old editions of these magazines. And I immediately was drawn to want to buy a whole stack, you know, and you used to have annuals yeah. in England, you know, even the comic books would have the year end annual yeah. with a hardcover and, you know, it'd be like this extra special edition. And this guy was selling this whole bundle of everything in there. And it wasn't cheap. It was like, you know, 200 pounds or something like that. Right. And I just it was just magazines, outdated magazines. But for some reason, I kind of feel moments of my life have been captured. It's in this, so nice. You know. So you got them. I didn't. <laughs> you didn't? <laughs> oh. I didn't. No. I, I, I was thinking about it. And then when I went back, it was gone. He had sold it. But I know it's always available. Oh, there's always someone wanting to sell that. But it made me reflect, what is it? Is it me trying to capture moments of my life in tangible, physical things? You know, So when I see them or I touch them, I can revisit yeah. or is it something else is it is it purely emotional you yeah. know and I don't need to read them anymore you know but because the emotion is there I don't know what was it why why did you go on to Mark Plotz to look for that camera because I was in Holland and I think my, my sons they uh, they kind of knew I think we had we were in a conversation I was seeing family here and and actually yeah they looked at old pictures in my family so they saw me with that camera and they're like dad where's that camera I'm like oh, told the story and then I thought you know I could totally see is that camera still exists it does I went online and I bought one through somebody in Brabant he sent it to me wonderful only it doesn't work oh, okay. <laughs> but that's okay yeah so but I still have it it's it's a it's just a little piece it's a memory but I, I should call my friend yeah I to see I what happened to I it think you should. yeah um so the the story is in Midabar school in, in, in early high school, you you discover this passion. You start working in the cameras in in, in a what, what what's it called? It's is it called a camera store? Or was yeah, it a photo, photo studio? Store. So people would bring in little films. Yeah, and yeah. Then you get negatives and printed, yeah. and then two days later you can pick it up. You get the envelope with so your prints. Yeah, so and, yeah. I had to count. Yeah. Uh, you know, before the store opens, I had to count these prints, put it on an envelope, thirty-five prints, 
developing. That's 38 guilders. That or world, uh, that yeah. world is so it was wonderful. Yeah. So I got to see a lot real quick. Yeah. You got to see other people's lives. Exactly. So the, forget the privacy. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, they didn't care? No. Yeah. No. And I, you know, because this is close to camping sites and the beaches. And so there were definitely some touchy things. And yeah. yeah. Here I'm a teenager, like, oh, she's cute, you know, like whatever. But uh, people would come, pick up their film. And then sometimes people would ask, Roche, what do you think? And then I saw, for example, I never forget, there was a gentleman. He um, he had photographed his wife in front of the Eiffel Tower, and I said, "Jan, you know, if you if you go to Paris with your wife, bring your wife a little closer to the camera. You can still see the Eiffel Tower, you know. But now she's like just as big as an ant, you know. You put her all the way there, you know. Like make it a bit more interesting. Make it a bit more about her." You know, the Eiffel Tower won't, won't go away, but your wife, you can definitely pay a little bit more attention to in, in wait, wait, photography. This is, this is teenage Roger giving right, advice right. And, to and a customer. Yeah, and so people really <laughs> like that. And so, because you look in these pictures, sometimes you, you see where mistakes are made, yeah. you know, or people cutting heads or just being off uh, or underexposing, overexposing. So you, you help them. And I swear, a lot of people really loved it and they would come back with more. And Jan Willem, the owner of the store, he said, what is this? You know, business was doing really well. You know, people were shooting more film uh, because they loved being told by this little this kid. This is a wonderful yeah. story, Roger. It's, yeah. like, it's like the single element that yeah. created a chemical reaction in, yeah, in the people a, of that village. Yeah, so I became a bit of a salesman. Of course, what I told them, I did also for myself. You know, when yeah. I shot for friends or wedding, I shot the yearbook for school. Uh, with the teachers, I had to portray all the teachers, and it gave me a great uh, way of uh, getting close to somebody that I normally never would be close to. You know, a math teacher, and I, I wasn't really bad at math. Uh, all this chemistry, I had to portray them. So it empowered me a bit, of course, to also make something interesting of this very boring man. <laughs> what were you doing? This was your approach similar. Were you trying to get them out of their... Right, I was definitely not the, the shy student then. I became, I feel as a photographer, I was more equal with them. Because in those days, again, I'm from the South, Catholic school, the teachers were like God, you know, most of them. Uh, so very, uh, a bit of... of yeah, you know? yeah. So there's a very hierarchical structure. Yeah, we are there, you now, are here. Yeah. Now the camera actually leveled it out a little bit. I realized that only now that we're talking about it. Because those pictures were sometimes very fun. You know, they were serious. The teachers I got along with, well, geography and history, got great pictures because I liked these guys. So I made sure that they were really yeah. em empathic. You with did them. justice yeah. To, yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe it was favoring <laughs> them a little bit here and there. <laughs> and R Roger, there's yeah. this very interesting <laughs> idea that, um, I forget who spoke about this, but uh, it was about how every human being needs a totem. And an example of that is um, Clark Kent and Superman, right? You know, yes. the, the two personas, right? But um, when he needs to inhibit the persona of Clark Kent, his totem are his glasses. The moment he puts it on, he inhibits a different side of his nature, right? Mm -hmm. But when he needs to step up and save the world, he takes off his glasses and he becomes Superman, right? Now, if you flip it around, um, you said something which was the camera seemed to be the, the equalizer, you know, the leveler, right? All of a sudden, was the camera the leveler or did you just tap into your totem? Did you activate that Roger that caused a different reaction from the teachers you were photographing? That's a good question. I think the camera was definitely a helpful piece of equipment. I also realize that when people, my assistants sometimes we do behind the scene things, I love to have a camera in my hand. Um, so yes, it's, it's a bit so of hiding It's a two-way thing. thing. The camera has it an is. effect, but it also has an effect on you, right? The it camera. It really is, yeah. To be behind and to hold it, um, to show who I am. I always tell people also, you know, sometimes people say, how long you want to do this and all that? 
I also tell people that I'm the happiest man when I have a camera in my hand, you know, to, 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 to work, to, it's not really work, but to make images. But that's true to this day, and I think it will be forever, actually. You know, <laughs> my wife is always laughing about it. Yeah, knock on wood, but I'm, I always say I'm, I'll never be done. I'm very ambitious, and there's still so much to be done. I I'm, I'm almost make lists every day, like, oh, I need to do this. Oh, this is nice to do. I was just in public transport here. I love sitting in the tram here. Um, so do I, actually. It's yeah. so, it was you so easy. Uh, I see yeah. different people, yeah. uh, different, uh, different fashion also. It's very interesting in Amsterdam uh, how people dress. You know, now that it gets a little colder. Um, I'm I'm not so fashionable, but I, I I do watch it with other people. What kind of shoes they wear? What kind of scarf? Oh, girl, that's not a good scarf for that coat. You know, and in the meantime, I should look in the mirror myself because I just <laughs> I doctors just, is worse patient. I, I, as I, they I, say. I, it's no commentary on your sense of style. Yeah, rather I, I just put on what's on top, really. So. But it's interesting that you see it now. You've yeah. done fashion enough to be yeah. able to. Well, and I I love people, you know, so. It, and I think also that's how I got I've been into fashion. Um, I like to work with people, and I think people are absolutely beautiful. Uh, there's you always find something very interesting. Doesn't matter who you have in front of the lens. There's always something there that that I want to zoom in on. Kind of like you know when people are a little shy or they they're uncomfortable. You of course you you try to make them comfortable in conversation. Talking really helps a lot. As a photographer, I talk a lot to my models, um, also in fashion, and sometimes I even apologize for it. But they always say, like, please keep talking with she said, because I, I, it, it, it helps me so much. You know, you have photographers that maybe want a certain kind of silence. No, I, I, want, I want conversation. So I don't want, when I shoot, I like nice music, but it needs to not be priority. So yes, we have playlists, but if it starts to bother me, normally I don't hear the music. But if I start hearing it, then something is mostly wrong, you know, like because it, it needs to be a, a low voice. Um, and I, yeah, to, to make it comfortable for the girls. Of course, with the Gea, you know, the hard rock, that helped. No. Not my kind of music yeah. necessarily. So it doesn't take you out of the zone because it, no, it's part because of. It, it kept me and him focused on where we were going, and I, I could get that special emotion from him. I could get the real David de Gea. Yeah, R Roger, I want to, I want to revisit something you said. Um, you, it's never felt like work. The moment you hold a camera, the magic is still there. Yeah. And you said you're still ambitious. There's still a lot you want to do, right? And I wrote something down here. Um, I thought I'll get to it at the end, but let's get to it right now, yeah, yeah. right? Um, which is a bucket list of places, people, moments you'd love to capture. And, and whether it's attainable or impossible, doesn't matter. For example, it could be Elvis and Atlantis, the city and the moon landing, you know, whatever. What's your bucket list? Any one of those categories. Let's take people first. Yeah. People, um, actually, traveling. Let's start with traveling. traveling. Yeah, okay. because that, that was actually the first thing I thought of. You know, you travel so much, and I still love it. You know, like when I'm here at Schiphol, also, it, it's like a, you you look at those boards or at JFK, and you're going to Amsterdam, and I'm like, oh wait, Shanghai, or Oman, or Senegal, and it's like I'm only like ten yards away. From those destinations right now, I can literally walk up to that gate and purchase a ticket and be gone. It's amazing, you know. Like what, what that, is that? What that's is kind that, of a freedom. What does that represent to you as a as? Is that you, the photographer, or is that you, Roger, the person? I think moment? the person because it's the adventure, the curiosity, right. the the like. Right. I was. Um, I always forget. No, don't forget the when I was ten years old, I had in geography classes, it was a fourth feeder class. I had uh, lessons about the Inca culture in Peru, and I was fascinated. And I thought, if I ever am old enough and I have a bit of money, that's where I'm going to go. I want to see that. And I was ten, and then 
of course that happened then uh, as a young photographer I had to do a shoot in Aruba and somehow I went to a travel agency there and I said how do I get from here I had to fly through Colombia oh great I stay in Colombia a couple of days too and then off to to uh, Lima and Cusco and you know this was still when you had to handwrite the airline tickets and I still see that travel agents in Aruba you know riding all the destinations your destiny down. as well your yeah. destinies are being but, written out, and yes. I thought oh let me do Medellin too because I saw on the map you know Bogota is close to Medellin and it was quite dangerous in those days but even that made it even more special for me and so the curiosity about traveling and that helped me of course with my photography um, I, I love to work in the studio but you cannot take the, the traveling away the excitement of that would be a shame you know like and is there a bucket list place or journey you'd like to yeah make? I think I've I still would love to <laughs> Um, I, I've been there a couple of times and now it's really hard to go there and not the right time. But uh, Russia, I've been a couple of times for shoots and it w I thought it was very special. It's such a big country, so I was always curious more about the, the Siberian side of it, which I've never been. There's uh, this Trans-Siberian yeah, yeah. Express, right? And, you know, so I, I'll be willing to do that like six days in the wagon, fine. Um, Japan, I still would love to do. I've only been in the Tokyo areas, and of course, that land, is, that country is so beautiful and magnificent and peaceful, which would be most likely very good for me too. To to come, I need to come to my peace a little bit. You know, um, I'm, do you, do you I'm, feel I'm fe I feel very rushed always where I go. Okay. Because I'm always curious, like what's around the corner. Mm. Um, even in New York. You know, like I live in the same area for a, a long time, but I'm always curious, like, oh, let's walk the block. Oh, let's try that one more corner too, because I want to see there's something that I haven't seen that I have not discovered yet. Uh, so it's a curiosity. So your life is one endless recce. A bit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But also the curiosity about people, because I, I, I literally love watching people and in the summertime here in Amsterdam, it's always nice to sit on terraces because yeah. you see so many wonderful people go by and and watch their uh, characteristics. In New York, that's a little better now, but you 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 didn't have uh, much terraces before COVID. Now it's full of terraces. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, um, bucket list. There's so many places. I've been in many places. Been very fortunate. Um, I love to revisit places, but the Antarctica, for example, go go complete north, go complete south. I was in Lapland, which was fabulous. And that's where you really come to yourself a little bit too, because you're in the middle of nowhere. All you have is the stars and that's it. And watching that go by is fantastic too. Another thing that I really want to do in my lifetime is circle the, er the earth. Yeah. Circle the earth, in yeah. in like or as along the equator or along the No, I want to go through it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I <laughs> watched his interview with uh, Bezos mm -hmm. yesterday, <laughs> and uh, he said this, you know, like being shot to the moon, that's really within reach for us, and I definitely want to be on that. Yeah, sign me up. Okay, sign so sign me up. I, I'm, and do you want to do that? again as roger the person or you want your camera in hand i'll definitely hope to be able to bring my camera okay. if that's not allowed i'll do it without because sometimes it's also nice to just experience it just seeing it using your senses i have that a lot when i do uh, i'm again talking about my work sometimes it makes me so happy because i just came back from a, an assignment that came also out of nowhere um, where I had to photograph in the Serengeti and I've been on many safaris and you cannot send me enough you know if people would say Roger you have to go next week or every month you have to go every other day or every other week I'll be sign you and why is that because it's the safaris to the the beauty of the land and the animals is so pure and you so come to your senses and first you're like you go crazy watching everything and then you sit down, relax, 
take your time. Don't make pictures. You know, I actually on this last trip, I purposely didn't bring a tele lens or anything. I just brought two cameras with short lenses. It was also not for uh, a geographic thing. Um, it, it was for uh, cosmetics, actually, and mood shots. Um, I enjoyed it so much by just observing and looking and trying to understand. Because the animals, they give you so much logic in their behavior that we have forgotten yeah you know as as people we um we we totally don't work with our own normalcy or logic anymore where the animals they they work with each other they even protect each other they're not just hunters or killers no they 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 respect each other's yeah, space. Yeah, they're running on a, an algorithm, right? Yeah, they, they, yeah. they expect each yeah. other's space. And then, of course, when nature calls, it's time to act on it. Yeah. But it's so beautiful to watch this. And when you have these rangers that explain that, I could listen for hours to yeah. these drivers. I think, you know, that's yeah. the problem. We apply mor morals and judgment yeah. on something that is existing beyond that. It's it's so pure, right? Yeah. And and I repeat that word because I, I, I've, I, I know what you mean. There is an algorithm running and you, our task as, as another species occupying the same space is to respect that algorithm and maybe try and make sense of it because I think that's what I'm hearing you do. In making, trying to make sense of it, you realize you belong there as well. But, you know... Um, and, and, and you have a right to be there, but in a different way than someone who just says, I want to I want to buy everything. I want to see everything. I want to go everywhere. Exactly. It's totally different. Exactly, Tony. It's it's amazing. They you feel like they teach you so much. Yeah. And with such beautiful grace, they they have it down. Yeah. They have life down. How do you we know? forget as a species? I don't know. <laughs> That's a yeah, that's a tough so one. But for me, it's nice to go back to places where it's so simple and pure. Yeah, and 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 just learn from that and try to bring a bit of that home too. When I come back from that, I really need a couple of days in New York um, where I can just enjoy the view I have from my kitchen window, um, my concrete jungle, the other algorithm. The other algorithm, which is also beautiful, that's what I love. About it Amsterdam is, as yeah. Well. That's yeah. why I love New York too. Yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm so blessed with that. But yeah, yeah, don't don't ask me then to oh let's um. Is the hair okay with a model, or is the lips red enough, or I don't care. <laughs> it's yeah. all fine. I, is it because yeah. you understand the bigger picture, or you see the bigger picture? Yes. Then. Right. By traveling, you learn the most. I feel it's like it's like the best book you can read. Uh, for me, in, in that case, so I love it. I, I'm, you know. There are a few thoughts floating in my head. I'm going to try and piece them together. I'm going to do my best. I hope I hope this is going to make sense. But um, you said you mentioned Cusco, right? Yes. You mentioned um, turning the corner because there might be something there. There is a journalist called Graham Hancock, and um, he studies cultures. Uh, human cultures, right, and history. Uh, and he says, we are a species, the human race is a species with amnesia because we have forgotten um, amazing, uh, we have forgotten who we, we are. And his theory purports that there have been amazingly advanced civilizations in the past, right? Whereas we believe we are at the apex of human culture and civilization, he argues there have been even possibly um, greater versions of civilization but it's been wiped out through cataclysmic events or, or you know, disease whatever it is and and um, south america figures quite prominently in his investigations and what's fascinating is that um i i what, what's missing is evidence and for me photographs are moments captured it's evidence right that yes. doesn't allow you to forget anymore so it, it it's the antidote to amnesia in Koningsplein here in Amsterdam, there's a flea market. And very often, there's one stand that comes in with stacks of old photographs, just randomly compiled together. And I always catch myself at that stand, removing a rubber band and going through these pictures, right? Yeah. And every one is 
an amazing story that I'll never know. And just that, you know, that one thread of seeing that photograph makes me wonder, right? And also reminds me that this person lived. There's a whole, there's a whole story in this picture. Yes. And it's one after the other. Uh, somehow I think that that is a role. Um, you know, anyone who's got, who wants to capture a moment, that's inadvertently a role you play and a task you fulfill. In, in society, you know, you, you kind of capture moments. And, and I think it also applies to whether it's fashion or whether it's capturing, you know, a Neymar or whoever, right? Yeah. There's the zeitgeist of the moment. I think the easiest way to understand it is to see a picture or see a, a film. Very true. I, I think the, uh, the registration of what our lives look like in, 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 in my way than through entertainment almost because what I do is uh, more entertaining, but yeah, it registers something of our culture as is now. Um, but even with social media, the way we make selfies or, or use social media with Instagram and TikTok, it definitely shows our culture, whether you like it or not, it's there. And that's not going to go away now. That's, that's done. How do you feel about uh, social media? Because, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, there have been... Um, stories about the impact of social media, especially on younger people, right? Your sons are in their 20s now, mm -hmm. I think. So I think they're just old enough to have escaped the, the kind of negative impact that is being studied now on social media. But for younger kids, right, um, the idea of portraying life um, in a way that may not necessarily be the truth, right? Because social media is my best life. Right. right, it's not my, my real life, right? Yeah. Uh, and they say it has a negative impact on people, but here is the medium of imagery, of video, being used to misrepresent, um, at least that's, that's um, the negative consequence of the impact on young people, right? Yep. There's also a positive consequence, which everyone now can, can I think enjoy this medium. How I do you feel about yeah, it? I think we ride that wave mm -hmm. for the good and the bad, I think now that we, we came to realize like, oh, there's a lot of bad in it too, or fake or too manipulated, that is what is real, what is fake. And then yesterday I read this article about deep fake. Yeah, that's, these are horrible things. Yet it's also the reality of what we techno technologically go through. And uh, I think our science is also ahead of us, luckily. Uh, so we learn from that and develop ourselves to criticize ourselves with that too. I do the same thing, you know, like in the beginning with uh, Instagram, for example, I thought every landscape I took was beautiful, so I posted it until uh, somebody said like, uh, Roger, this is boring. <laughs> <laughs> so just- Who was that just, very honest yeah, who do you think? <laughs> so, who, uh, so do what you do best and, you know, tone it down a notch and show people again. So yeah, she, she was right. Um, you know, make it more interesting. It all depends on what's interesting for you, but you can use it personally, you can uh, use it professionally. I think uh, I'm, I'm very much for developing and for trying out new things, even though you make missteps in it, and we all do. But I think that's part of how we have to develop ourselves, you know, learn from our mistakes. Roger, you've, you've gone through the stages of analog and then digital, and now yeah. you've reached the stage of uh, witnessing the impact of technology like AI and machine learning and how it's affecting the creative sector as well, right? Yes. Um, um, how, how is it, if it is at all, impacting your life, and how do you think it might impact the world of photography? It impacts it every moment, every day. Uh, you got to grow with what with your profession what you see when i switched from analog to uh digital yes of course you have a couple of clients that are like do you do digital i'm like yes of course in my head of course i'm like okay now what <laughs> so you try to create also the good people uh you try to learn yourself but i learn a lot more from other people that know better so experts in that area you know you i can do good camera work but I can say I have maybe a good eye, but I see camera work from other people. And I'm like, wow, I wish I had. You know, so you, you need to work with people like that. You know, light, I can see light very well, but nothing, nothing is better than working with 
uh, specialists. So you got to look for those people too, those teams that that actually can teach you, and I can teach them. I, I lately I've been, you know, besides photography, I've been doing a lot of video, uh, working with people that needed me, and I needed them. You know, and that's pure coincidence. Like that, where they say, like Roche, what do you think of this? Could you get these girls to do this? You know, like, and that's pure communicating. And then it's so wonderful to be sucked in, introduced to that world, and respected, and vice versa, because they taught me things that I'm like, wow, fantastic. Keep an open mind. I guess that's uh, at my age also. Keep an open mind to what's what's happening around you. Definitely listening to the younger generations too. You know, where my son makes way better little TikTok videos and stuff. I'm like, how do you do that? You know, like just keep keep looking, keep listening. Be curious. Yeah, be curious constantly. Speaking constantly. of the younger yeah. generation, Roger, um, if if you had to give advice to someone who's contemplating photography as a career, someone who is mm -hmm. you at 12, 13, 14 again, right? What would you tell them? What advice would you give them? I would definitely go, go get, you know, be young enough to, to get basics, which is what I did. So, you know, like you, you go to school and you get the basics. Use that school time to practice and learn from the mistakes and communicate with people constantly. Even the people that like turn you down maybe. Hey, be patient, be patient. You know, like um, I work with uh, a girl who, who tried to do an internship and, and I, I missed my own appointment with her. So I made up, so we meet again. And you know, like now we've been working for two, three years together. You know, she's learning a lot, she's like fantastic. She's, she's going her way. You know, being ambitious and don't be afraid to knock on somebody's door and knock again. <laughs> I, d I do the same thing. <laughs> I've been chasing some people here in Holland also for so, a couple so of days these are now. So people you wanna you wanna photograph? <laughs> yes, yes, or work with. Yes. So these are professionals, fellow professionals yes. you wanna work with. Yeah. Or subjects you wanna. Yeah. It's wanna it's uh, you know I'm just like I should have done that you know with President Obama. Yeah. Always wanted to photograph him. I should have just gone to the White House and knock on his door. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so that, that reminds me of something I read, yeah. Yeah? and, and yeah. I want to dig into this 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 go getter attitude, right? Yeah. Um, it was written somewhere that at 19, Roger Neff flies to New York to convince Cosmopolitan magazine to give him an eight-page spread, which right. the magazine does. How did uh, this happen? What uh, did you tell them? What was your pitch? Uh, th there was less security those days, okay. I have to admit. So it was easier to walk into buildings. Yet you had to... Oh, less security as in physical security uh, at the Physical door. security. <laughs> okay. but, but an example, so when I was 19, I, I remember I needed... Um, I wanted to test, as they say in my business, uh, make some free work, exam ex uh, assignments. Um, I didn't get anywhere. And... I need the models. So I went through the yellow pages. There was no internet then. <laughs> and I saw this big printed letter, Eileen Ford, model ANC. Big, four models, big ANC. So I just went there on 59th Street under the Williamsburg Bridge. I called up. I said, I'd like to make an appointment with Miss Ford. No, no, she's not available, blah, blah, Same story. I said, well, I, I'll be there at 12 o'clock. I have a personal message and I'll wait. So I went there. And then uh, the secretary, same story, go wait and wait forever if you want to. You know, they can't kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> and then after a couple of minutes, this one woman runs through the office like, who is this kid that wants to see me? You know, like, <laughs> and that was Miss Ford. Come in my office right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the yeah. stuff you see in a movie. But this it was, it was like happened. a movie. This is real life. And right uh, I had so a how old you were 19? 19. I had a little portfolio with some work and a couple of girls in there. And I had a card to play. There was a girl that she had not represented yet in New York, but was starting to break through in Paris. A Dutch girl? Yeah. Okay. And um, beautiful thing is uh, her name is Linda Spearings. Mm -hmm. I just saw this morning. She's on the cover of Dutch Folk Isn't after all these years. Amazing. So it's like coming yeah. full circle. Linda helped me out with testing as she was doing the runway shows. So I owe her a lot. In that. So she was your, your guinea pig? In a way, yeah. yeah. So 
Miss Ford looks at her pitch. She said, Linda Spearings? I said, yeah, she, she's still looking for an agent here in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the deal was done. She said, okay, I'm gonna, you introduce me to Linda or her management, and I introduce you to the whole uh, New Faces division. And so, so happened. So it, it, that was a kind of barter that happened yeah. there and then. So she introduced me to Stuart Routes, who was head of fa New Faces in New York. He introduced me to all these new faces that I could photograph every day that needed portfolios. So it was great. But now I needed locations. He took care of her makeup people. So I got introduced to all doors opened by just looking at yellow pages and knocking on doors. And yes, I got lucky. Yeah, Roger. But you got to, you got to, you got to, yeah. Do you make your luck though. Challenge that itself. I, yeah. I, and I still do that. I, I was on a shoot in, in, um, and we needed a penthouse overlooking the city in Hong Kong. And it was very expensive and very hard to, to get a place like that. And I just looked up to the city and I told the director, like, you know, that looks good. We should just knock on that door, you know, and it's a complete strange city. So I did. And the doorman was like, no, they're not home. I said, well, leave a message. Here's my number. The owner of the penthouse called me back in my hotel. Uh, come check it out and feel welcome. You know, and that, I never forget that. And then we had the most beautiful location in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, you yeah. know, the worst that could happen is they'll say no. Right? Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but say, why is it so difficult knowing that? Yeah. So uh, people are better than what we sometimes assume. In New York too, I I walk by a building that's under construction, and you think like, oh, that's not for me. No, it's these are normal people working on that, and the elevators with helmets on. You know, talk to them. Uh, I don't smoke, but have a cigarette with them. Bring them a coffee, and show me what you're doing. And how they and they take you up to the top floor, and and it's like show you their work. How much of what you're saying now is because you are you? you are the person that you are yeah i think i i thank a lot to where i come from you know like in from a very small town you you talk to people in the market in the bar in the supermarket with the baker you have a little chat with them have a little time i do that a lot with uh taxi drivers uber drivers also here in amsterdam fantastic i meet so many people you know and and sometimes you meet them again you know, um, as we talked about, I'm a big soccer fan. I've, I've found some drivers here in Amsterdam. They play like uh, recreational teams in the, over the weekends. I'm not a lot in Amsterdam, but I can't wait to just go to one of their games. And they're like, bring your shoes, you know, like from all backgrounds, really from all backgrounds. Yeah. I think I think it's, I think you just love people. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. I, I think that's yeah. the core of who you are. Speaking of that, I'm reminded, I, for the life of me, I, I can't remember the name, mm -hmm. but I know there was a photographer, and I think he was very much like you, a fashion photographer who also shot a lot of celebrities. And he said, um, he said, I, f I fall in love a little with every woman I photograph. I don't remember who it was, but and, yeah. and, and that's not the quote, but it was along those lines. There's yeah. a little bit I fall in love, right? And I'm wondering, is, is feeling love, attraction, whatever it is for your subject, does it influence the outcome of what you're doing? Yeah, you, you get really close to the person and they become your best friends on that moment. Because it's also a very intimate moment, yeah. right? Yeah, and, but it's a, it's, you're on a high for that moment. So all my last shoes that I can remember now, um, the of course the image is a wonderful memory of that moment but that was then yeah and the emotion stays but the the highlight was definitely that day that moment and you can share it again you know by by sending a nice pdf or a print but that moment itself was at really on the moment it was created you know so coming back to that photographer but I, I truly have that also um, with, with people, you know, that you're like, oh, let's let's have a coffee, and and that happens. But it's sharing that wonderful high you had together. Yeah, yeah. 
I, is know. it also a desire to maintain that high? You, you try, you try. try. I got to be honest, it's almost impossible. Then again, there's moments where it's so special that you, you stay friends. And that definitely has that happened. That is special. Right? Yeah. That, that's not, I yeah. think it's also because of the fact that um, um, the, the type of people you're dealing with, they're public figures, right? Or, or very successful at their careers and there's glamour and there's celebrity yeah. attached to it. And um, I think we want to believe that they're different. And like you said, you know, um, a, a soccer player or a movie star yeah. has very little time. So you have this, this brief moment and they generally have very little time. It's the same as yeah. a CEO, uh, as Elon Musk. He, you yeah. know, he has very little time. But in, in within the, the restrictions of, of, of time, if a real connection is made, a connection that says, you know what, I'm going to try and create some more time with you again. Then it stays. Yeah. It stays. I mean, that it's impossible to do that in every occasion. And I wish I could. And, so you and, do, the, and you the other people, oh, absolutely. But the days are only 24-7, uh, which is a shame. Um, I don't need much sleep, but it's, it's really a shame that I cannot reach out to more people that I photographed and just say hello. Yet, it does happen. You know, like when social media, sometimes you see a message, it's like, wow, this person I haven't spoken to for a year, and they see your work or, you know, they connect then it's wonderful to reach out. And uh, I do that a lot with my friends here in Amsterdam. You know, I feel, you know, when I'm back here, I feel this is definitely a good place for me to be. Um, I'm very Dutch that way, you know, uh, more so than most people think. <laughs> yeah, also with the World Cup, you know. Yeah. I could wear oranges all week. <laughs> and nobody it's does. this week, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, Roger, I, I, I have the one question it, it's mm -hmm. it's a very cliche question but you know i have to ask it right which is um how do you and again the whole idea behind this conversation is to learn from people in different fields under different pressures etc um, your pressure is that you're constantly on the move mm -hmm. you're constantly in new faces you're constantly in very exciting situations i think as well right situations that could uh, make the daily you know, um, conventional life seem pale in comparison because, you know, you're on a, as I as I hyperbolically said earlier, you're on a movie set and you're in a stadium, you know, with a with, yeah. with soccer players in a, in a hotel suite with someone. And then you come back home and you have a wife and you have two children. Right. And I think you've been married for quite some time or together with your with your right. uh, partner for quite some time. Your sons are grown up and from the little you've told me about them, you have a good bond with them. You share moments, you make moments and time for them. Yeah. Lovely. It was so lovely to hear that. How how have you maintained this and um, what were the challenges? I, I think uh, I, I owe a lot to the people around me, you know, starting with my mom and dad where I'm from, family has always been a very, uh, very important thing, you know. Um, they, they gave me a lot of freedom. My wife, who I've been married to 30 years now, um, is fantastic. Of course, you have your ups and downs, but she's always been very supportive. I remember when we just dated, she said, you know, like, um, she said something like, I'm, I'm not going to stand in your way. It's like, wow. Uh, I think she's, she's been a very fantastic engine in support. My sons are my best friends. They're like in their early 20s. So we, we share a lot of things together. Uh, but uh, Trish is definitely somebody that keeps the family really together. A Thanksgiving dinner, a Christmas thing, a holiday thing, it's very important to her. I better be there. I'm yeah. not. Gonna, I'm not going to stand in your way. So she became a partner, a true right. partner. Right. That, that was that then. Sense. You know, like you're you're in love, and yeah. she she knew what I was doing. And why? And um, of course, things throughout life have changed a lot, and you you have to make decisions. You know yeah. where, but um, she. E even within all that, it's like she says. Sometimes it's nice to have a husband when I go to a birthday party or whatever. Uh, so I, you try to do that, yeah. but then she's also she knows that that I'm very happy to to be with that camera in my hand on on a mission. 
because she also knows me. She has yeah. met me that way, and she still sees me that way. And it's not always easy on that side. I think for the p people staying at home, it's always way harder. Than, uh, so they need to also have a life that, that's a that where they're able to have that life also without you. So enough friends, enough interests. Yeah. You know, she, she does a lot of other things that have nothing to do with representing me. Uh, you know, that goes from charities to museums to fundraisers, friends. Um, I was on a shoot in the Caribbean and she, um, she books my hotel rooms most of the time, my agenda, and she had a rental car on that day. And I look at the email, I'm like, Trish, this email is, that car is not in that island. That's a whole different island. And I, th I thought, she said, well, I'm going to the other island with a friend. <laughs> and this, I'm like, I was like, wow, that's my <laughs> wife. And I love that. Yeah. You know, it's like she does not always need me to ask the permission to do what she wants to do. She spontaneously did the same thing, yeah. only with a friend. You go do your thing in, in Bonaire, do your shoot. Uh, I'm, I'm a couple hundred miles away on a whole different island. So that rental car was not for you. It's Sorry. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, it, it's... Um, but that's great. It's, that, that that's a partnership. Right? That's in the, the yeah. independency. She yeah. shows there, fantastic. And you both are not there to stand in each other's way. You're there to support right. each other as collaborators in this thing called a relationship, right? Right. And, and I, I, I kind of think... She's it's flexible. Like, yeah. And I'm not going to say it's always uh, blah, blah, but it's she, she has my back and, and, and I love that. I yeah. think it's about core, the core principle that, that indeed that's what it's about, right? Yeah. You know, we, t we make an agreement. I mean, at the end of the day, a relationship, it's the same when you have a subject you're photographing. There's, there's a core agreement between the two parties, right? Yeah. And I think when the core agreement is respected and you don't bring human emotion into into breaking away from the core agreement you can you can negotiate it right renegotiate it discuss it but you can't allow your own um, frustrations or insecurities or fears to say i want to break that core agreement we had and it yeah. sounds like from the start it was i'm not going to stand in your way i know what you want i know you have ambition yeah and it's going to take you far away often yeah. right sometimes she took that back though yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's but you that's being human yeah right? that's human but too. you're together for 30 years i think yeah, exactly. i think that is testament to yeah. to the there, agreement there, being respected there's yeah. moments i definitely need to be there you know and as long as you're flexible but yeah see we operate very well that way and she's very um included in what i do she comes up like i said with creative ideas that are wonderful to work on together well and we do that every day we've seen that as well i've yeah. seen that with with some of uh trisha's mood boards and ideas exactly, etc yeah. so you are both creatives right yeah. sometimes that's not always a good recipe <laughs> okay? right. she's also my biggest critic if humbling that yeah, is, that is she is really good. is yeah. it's okay. like sometimes i'm after production i'm like i'm gonna wait a day i want to look at it again before i present it yeah. um because she She's dead honest. She's a real New Yorker and tells me how it is. But also, I think after yeah. all this time and working together with you, she also can, she, she sees things that you might miss. Yeah. So again, oh. there's a partnership that really is working yeah. here. You're very lucky. You're very and lucky, I, I, Roger. I have, I have my reasons to execute certain things. Yeah. Uh, sometimes that's not always easy to understand yeah. on the other side. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it you have to be, be there. It, you, it doesn't turn out the way you want it to, but you wish it is, and you're trying to find the reason yeah. why. So I need to improvise yeah. on set itself. Yeah. You can sketch it out with your mood boards as clear as you want, but the reality is always going to be different. So, well. Trishan, you have both creatives, and you've got two sons now. Yes. Do you see the creative bent in either one of them, maybe both of them? I think so. I think um, the... They're both creative. They're, they don't do what I do at all. The one is more engineering and he's more in sports, uh, athletic, wear designing as an engineer. So with it's amazing what goes in the shoe. I had no idea. Uh, I, I, find that, I find that science quite an art in itself. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And he's absolutely fantastic with it. The other one is also more, and they're both very much into sports. And so he's more in sports entertainment. What, uh, what does that mean? Uh, like he's... Um, right now, he's designing and also doing strategy for a company that 
manufactures sports clothing. And so in this case, it's 10,000. Uh, Noah does also Nobu, which is uh, this brand I'm wearing, actually. <laughs> nice the, little the, plug the, there. The perks, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, they, they definitely tend to go more in sports and strategy. And Noah more in design, so he's, he's also more innovative. So he's in the development part of that. Yeah. So and ha, ha, and uh, have they been have they been your subjects as well? Not really. Only when we did um, only when we did some athletic wear. Sometimes I would photograph them and try things out. Yes. Okay. How do they feel being in front of dad's camera? Oh, they love it. They love it. Yeah. They they know uh, also when they were a little younger. They in in their vacation time they would help me out with assisting a little bit, okay. travel with me over the world. So that was wonderful, yeah. But now they went their own way. So. It's, it's interesting because uh, as a young man, um, if you witness your dad mm -hmm. being around amazing and beautiful human beings in, in exotic places, you know, in a very glamorous field of work, right? right. It's, it's very hard to not fall in love with that. They truly love what I do. Now that they're both in the professional world, since they just finished their their college time in universities sometimes I see because they are more in a pattern of the work days and the work at home days and the, the vacation days and they see their dad is like um, working through the weekends but then off to wherever yeah, uh, so for, for me, <laughs> and vice versa, for me yeah. there's no Saturday Sundays really yeah. Um, so yeah they see the freedom that I have which they love. See, yeah. that, that, that is a very addictive thing. But they also see the inconsistency of it all. So, yeah. The uh, how, how um, so, this is me passing judgment, but I find freedom, I say it's an addictive word because I yeah. think in our, in our hearts, we all want that as human beings. I think it's one of the simplest things and the most profound things uh, you can experience freedom, right? You know? Right. And, uh, and then you said unstructured? What uh, what in, inconsistent. inconsistent. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely structure do only. The, do these, do these, are these incompatible ideas, inconsistency and freedom? Well, they, they, they have that consistency mm -hmm. in, in their professional world and they love their jobs. I have a complete inconsistency. I can work sometimes three times a day or three weeks, not at all depending on the agenda and the demand yeah. and the planning is sometimes certain clients want everybody wants exactly that week yeah and they get, can't move forward or after so i can only take one client at a time so then in a way you're you're messed up with your agenda so that's the inconsistency uh, i i just got to take care of myself also with uh, social security things like that yeah. medicare uh, those are things that, as a freelancer, is is very inconsistent. So the uh, you, you can't depend on the paycheck coming through the mail no box there is on nothing. a certain date, yeah. right? So yeah, <laughs> if I don't work, it's yeah. uh, so but you, there's yeah. also the beauty about it. In the in all the years that I worked, I, I've only maybe one day uh, I missed because I I just couldn't. And oh, that was with uh, Paula Zahn. She was a TV anchor. And she said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not. And I laid down in the studio. I just couldn't move anymore. Oh, and really? See, I, I remember her looking over me like, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, just give me an hour. That was the only time that I had to stop. Was you it know? exhaustion? I think, I, I, I think so. I think so. I never figured it out. Wow. You know, just when your body gives up. For the rest, I'm... So you're not superhuman after all. No, Roger no, no. no I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, oh, I feel I'm very lucky. I'm very fit. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, I'm a normal person. You know, I should work out more, which I don't. I love the game don't, of soccer. Don't we all wish we could work yeah. out more? But but you still play, right? Every now and then you put on your shoes and. Uh, yes, but it's. You know, not happening enough. My son's laughing. Me <laughs> like that. Nice. Let them. Uh, the the old man. Of youth. <laughs> Speaking of youth, I'm gonna round this up with a yep. famous quote by this guy called W. C. Fields. Have you heard of W. C. Fields? Yes, yes. Okay. He said, "Never work with children or animals." <laughs> How do you feel about <laughs> that? <laughs> Good one. Of course, I love children. He's right, though. He's you know, like it, it's like children you can't direct. 
you know, you, you got to go with them. They're going to love it. And of course, you can manipulate them a little bit when you photograph them. I had a time where I did photograph a lot of children and I loved it, but it was wearing me out. And people loved it so much that they started to book me more and more for jobs with children. So all of a sudden you find yourself on 10 day jobs with 12 children and 24 parents and tutors and everything. And I thought, okay, I need to make a, a move. And so I, then I uh, had my own children and I thought, okay, this is a great excuse. I'm gonna focus on my own children privately. So I'm gonna apologize and I'm, I can't take your job. So I went back into more, um, yeah, the- uh, Non-children. Non -children. <laughs> Animals, same thing. It happens a lot that a client says like, oh, look, how cute, let's book an animal in this or a dog here or you know something there. Or cats, you know, like it's like, it's tough. If it has a really good purpose, it's fantastic. I did a shoot with cats and mouses. I yeah. never forget it. It was great because then it's it's essential that you bring something out on those animals. I, I had a cat with a Dior bracelet on her neck. It's one of the best pictures. I was once at a presentation a couple of weeks ago and this creative director said, oh my God, I love this. So then you know like you hit it right. So the purpose of using an animal, fantastic and on safari, of course, to the animals. You know, I, I unforgettable. But the then you're bearing witness, right? Yes. With the Dior cat, you were trying to get something. Right, but then also yeah. when when I saw animals just on that shoot where I did some mood shots and we had to photograph in beautiful places, we also made sure we made plates of the animals because you cannot catch them all at once. But I, I caught them in such a way that, okay, I can plant the giraffes here and a bit of wildebeest there. And uh, how do you call that? The warthog? It's there's a warthog. Yeah, the warthog, but they're so cute when they run at you. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> with the little like, tusks. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, were on the, they were close to a spot where I was shooting and there was a mud pool. And of course, they need to, they need to wash themselves and cool down. But we were too close when my mom was to that spot and the jeeps so and protection there and you could see them running towards that area a little bit and then they went away again they come closer they went away again and slowly a little closer and i thought oh my god i need to snap them so i snapped them so mm. i put them into one of the other shots you know like where they look just over the grass and to me that's just a little detail but that's where the animal is so wonderful. He completes that landscape for me, that little warthog. So uh, it's funny that the story of the warthog you just told feels to me like the story of how you, you capture the moment with the human being. It was They come closer, but they go back. So true, they Tony. They come closer and they go yeah, back. Yeah, it was a, a give and take a little bit yeah. because I felt bad. I was in the shower. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I don't, don't go in my bathroom, my, my shower. I. I like to go to the bathroom too. So they they kind of like were trying to tell me, uh, excuse me, you're my you're my house, yeah. you're my area. So I really told my crew also, and we all laughed, like we gotta move because we all started to feel bad. The sun was getting hotter and hotter. These animals, they're suffering because they want to get to the are we yeah. to be there? Yeah. You know, like and take their take their space. So they needed their space and they were very kindly uh, fighting for their space. And you graciously and exited. I, yeah. Exit scene. It was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's interesting you say that. It's, that was a play between animal and human. And I think, Roger Neff, yeah. you are a master of that play, actually. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, Roger, for doing this. It's been an utter thank pleasure. You. You're so welcome. And let's do this again. It was wonderful. I would love to. Yeah. Let's thank, you. Again. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Cheers. Thank you.